I think you know one of the sort of things that really draws us to sort of blockchain and Web three is the fact that you can participate in the shared network effect, and that in the end of the day, yes, some people might make a lot more money than you, but if you are within the network, then you can participate in the network as well, and therefore gain if as others gain too. Some of our most high profile success stories, whether it's a sandbox or Decentraland or Axie Infinity or OpenSea or Dapper Labs, actually we worked with them all back in 2018, 2019. That's how we got our opportunity to also invest in them or in some cases um, sort of own them. And that actually is, um, is the opportunity and we see it exactly the same way. So from our perspective, since we take a long view, actually this is the best time to build because also from an investment standpoint, it's no longer just, um, you know, you got to close the deal next week. Otherwise you miss out, right? You actually have time to do sort of a length, lengthier and more sort of thorough due diligence. You can have conversations with the team. Nobody expects the deal will close, you know, within the next five days. It's more like, okay, take, you know, we need to analyze and review. And, and, um, and I think that's actually uh, created a, a much healthier uh, sort of environment as well. And, at the end of the day, when you look at the value, just as an example of the value of the tokens in question, it's a blip really, because when you compare it from 2018 to where we are today, uh, which is really only four years, right? Um, it's actually, um, you know, generally a pretty positive lineup. But then if you have to take the lens for the last six months, you might say, oh my goodness, disaster. Uh, and, you know, I just, um, I was just in Korea about two weeks ago, speaking of Korea Blockchain Week. And I gave a parallel, a comparison between sort of the miracle on the Han River, which is basically the Korean economy. And for those who don't maybe know, Korea actually some four decades ago, its economic capacity, size, and population was much. It was actually smaller than North Korea. And uh, it now, you know, it's you know somewhere between number ten or number twelve in the global GDP. Right? It's it's one of the wealthiest, most powerful nations in the world. And one interesting thing is that it's entirely driven by the value and power of culture because South Korea doesn't have natural resources. It doesn't have oil. It doesn't have, it, what it has is intellectual capacity. It has innovation, it has ideas, it has culture. Um, but all the things you know, that it did to evolve to where it is today. And then you remember the Asian economic crisis and that was pretty disastrous. But when you chart it out, it ends up looking like a blip as well, right? In the relative span of where Korea was and where it is today. So I, I view this current scenario, you know, in a, in a very similar lens. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really interesting point. Uh, South Korea, you know, going back to 98, got absolutely obliterated, as all did all the Asian economies. But the funding that really had gone into Korea in the prior 10 years ended up being the outcome afterwards, which was this incredible economy. And what I'm noticing now in the digital asset markets is, what, 60 billion of VC money went in in the last 18 months. And it's almost at the perfect time. Yes, the you know a year ago, everyone was still scrambling to do deals too quickly. But basically, there's been a huge amount of capital put in over this period of building when everybody's focused on actually building stuff and not on the price goes up, you know, number go up, because that's distracting for everybody. So it kind of feels like the set of outcomes coming out of this might potentially be really game changing because the amount of capital that went in and the number of new paths that everybody's taking here. One other interesting parallel as well is if you look at, for instance, blockchain gaming, um, almost all the funding in the last six to 12 months has gone into blockchain gaming companies in the gaming space, for instance, which is basically just another signal of the inevitability of where blockchain gaming is going because of just the investment. Also, the smartest people in gaming are starting to look at that and have either already joined or built startups and, and entered this field. And perhaps the other interesting statistic is that in the last six to 12 months, uh, many investors who are not in crypto have entered the uh, sort of the Web3 world or the you know, blockchain world through gaming for the first time. So their lens, their entry into blockchain. So it's not just adoption of the sort of mass consumer it's actually the adoption of the traditional investor as well, because they understand the narrative and they appreciate that, that potential differently than say, let's invest in a token um, that you can trade, for instance, but more of the fundamental of, you know, while well, a game that has ownership should be more powerful as a narrative, should be more meaningful to the end user 
um, has maybe better revenue potential. These these sort of more fundamental aspects um, are attractive to, I guess, the traditional value investor. And so they've entered uh, the, the world of crypto through gaming. I think one of the really interesting projects that's been an enormous rise since we last spoke was Yuga. Yes. You know, Yuga really were the pioneers of building a community around an NFT, a PFP, but then created an entire ecosystem around it, you know, with the the genius of you know buying CryptoPunks and all of that as well, the um, the Lava Lab stuff, and then on top of it, then they're moving towards gaming with the metaverse experience of the other side, and we're seeing these things all merge together. So we've got kind of NFTs, they've got a social token which is a fungible token, and they've got now a metaverse experience which is probably based around gaming, as far as we know. Maybe just one clarification as far as ApeCoin is concerned. Actually, the way to think of it is that you know, it's, not, it's not their token, right? ApeCoin is its own token. And you know, Yuga Labs adopted the token. Um, but it, of course, started, you could say, through you know, the drop, basically through the community of Yuga, you could say. But, but it doesn't end there, right? So, and the whole idea of ApeCoin as a foundation is to expand and grow the the metaverse and, and uh, as, a, as an entire space, uh, and but but the separately Yuga Labs with with the other side also is separately also making games. So our studio anyway is producing separate games with uh, with Yuga Labs, for instance, and that has already been announced. But uh, you know the details of that you know still to be still to be disclosed. But you know there's many partnerships that they're building on, and gaming really if you think about it for. The, this particular generation is one of the strongest, most powerful forms of distributing culture and distributing sort of media and information, because that's where we spend most of our time, right? Gaming as an industry today anyway, is already larger than film and music combined. Uh, last year was 180 to $190 billion industry um, and occupies the attention of 3.4 billion people today. Now, the whole internet is something like 5 billion people, give or take, which basically means most of the world is gaming. So the other thing is that in gaming, the attention, the time you spend in gaming is also far more immersive than watching a movie. And I think that is sort of the important part about that every metaverse project, you know, whether it's through PFP, whether it's through whatever aspect it is, must have a gaming strategy of some sort, because gaming is the, mecha is the mechanism in which the soft power of that culture is distributed. America's soft power, and America's power, you know, we believe anyway, isn't just the military and the US dollar. That's obviously the hard power, you could say. But actually what made the hard power possible to execute was the fact that it had the most influential cultural soft power in the world, which was Hollywood, right? And it's literature. You know, we're watching, you know, Friends, and we're watching, you know, Marvel movies, and we're watching... What do they do? They disseminate American culture, American values to the rest of the world. And that's how they influence it. And then when you know, American business enters these countries, they're open to it. They're friendly. They're like, oh, wait, you know, yes, we like the system. We like this culture. We want hamburgers. We want whatever, Nike shoes, you know, whatever that is. Uh, we're, the, the world has basically been already sort of um, influenced through the soft power of American culture and the metaverse is really functions the same way, but that self culture, self self power um, uh, culture is basically through the lens of gaming. But how difficult is it to choose what games are going to work? Because, I mean, there's a lot of games in the world, right? It's like, there's a lot of apps in the Apple App Store, and ninety nine percent of them don't. Now, you know, you do a lot of investing in this space. At this particular nexus is one of your key focuses. How the hell do you find what you think? is going to be successful? Because I find that really difficult. Yeah, so one of the uh, real difficulties in the traditional gaming world has been that gaming was considered very much a hit-driven business. Um, much, I guess, like Hollywood, right? You, you, you know, And that's one of the reasons why much of the funding and investment would typically go to sort of people who've had historical successes. Because it's a little bit like, well, if Steven Spielberg makes a movie, chances are it's really good. So here, take my money, right? That's kind of the, and, and, and gaming has functioned in many ways the same way. Uh, and then you needed the big studios, whether this was EA or Activision or, you know, um, Nexon or those companies who would have the financial muscle to finance these incredible games and then hopefully see them succeed. And that's the traditional model. And so t 
typically VCs have stayed away from this because it was very hard for them to understand. Well, how do I know this is going to work? Because it's not very scientific. It's it's a little bit of a sort of you know, it's, again, it's culture. It's it's sort of a feeling. It's it's like taking a bet on a person's creative idea, and you know, it's not just a you know small investment. You know, some of these games cost hundreds of millions of dollars to produce. So you're taking a really big bet to, to make it work. And you have elements like maybe access to distribution, special relationships, all these things that maybe you can leverage. But broadly speaking, you're taking a bet on a very talented team, and that's because most games today still have very inflationary designs which means that the gaming economy itself is not a value. And the users themselves are really only experiencing the game as a form of entertainment. But what's changed, of course, is that because of the amount of time people spend on games, to the gamer, so the game company who's making the game, it's entertainment. So they monetize it like a movie almost, just maybe in better ways. But for the gamer, it's not entertainment. It's actually much closer to their personal identity. When you play a game and you have a rank, it means something. When you buy a skin, you show it off to your friends, um, or when you win it in a competition, and it's your social status. So, to, so the relationship between how the gamer sees his relationship with the game has become different from how the game studio sees it, which sees it generally just as an avenue of monetizing and, and driving value. So, so this is one of the reasons why we focus on gaming and block, uh, so blockchain and gaming, because gamers already had a sense of ownership, even though they're just renting. And so, therefore, we felt that that was sort of one of the easiest and best paths of adoption. Although, you know, there are some differences where in the West, as of late, you know, many Western players are not so positive around um, blockchain games um, because of the fact that, you know, it appears to them sort of the sort of extreme capitalization and sort of financification of that. But in the East, in Asia, everyone loves it and it's, 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 it's all over it. So it's a very, it's, a, it's an interesting sort of, um, um, sort of difference there. Hey, visionaries, thank you for tuning in. For more free crypto content like this, head over to realvision.com forward slash crypto. You'll get early access to the most brilliant minds in the space to cut through the noise, get in-depth analysis, and get you ahead of the curve with unbiased insights.